I want to welcome Karim El Hakim, the filmmaker um, of Half Revolution, to come up and just say a few words about the film before we're privileged to see it. Um, so thank you all again for coming. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Um, <clears throat> thanks to American University for hosting uh, hosting me and bringing me all the way from Cairo to, uh, to be here and to show you this film. Uh, we're lucky enough to be rolling out into cinemas uh, at the end of October, so if you like the film and you want to recommend it to your friends, you'll be able to see it uh, at East Street Cinema on the 25th of October, coming up. Uh, and I'll speak a little bit more about that after you get a chance to see the film. Um, I won't say too much, but I will uh, do something which has kind of turned out to be a bit of a tradition. Um, and this is a poem that, uh, this is a book of poetry that was written by my uncle Sharif al-Hakim. And I usually re read this poem before the screening. It's what I read at Sundance. And it's called Day of Departure at Tahrir Square. To the Martyrs of the Lotus Revolution. This day, this joyful, sunny winter Friday, we put our best clothes on. We gathered together at Tahrir Square to sound our trumpets, to blow our horns, to celebrate the arrival of the new dawn. Anointed in perfect perfume, musk and lotus of dawn, and against all odds of poison gas and gangs and guns of thugs, Selmeya, Selmeya, by alchemy alone, just vinegar and onions, no smoking guns. Victory celebrated by songs and hugs. Out from the black swamp, police day, January 25th, 2011, Lotus Revolution. This day of departure at Liberation Square, millions of ancient Egyptian Copts and revolts, Muslims and Christians united as one, all whispering, Allah, take us out of this black swamp. Hidden one in every heart, we are no longer afraid of the secret police. Come out and shine, brothers and sisters, Exodus. Our teachers have shown us the way. We are no longer afraid of the secret police. We are out in the light of day for all to see. We shine our light. Can you see? The greatest deceiver of modern times, and if he and his gang do not care to leave, we Egyptians have long departed from his rule. Our government is love without fear. No tyrant can rule. Night cannot stop the rising sun. This day of departure at Tahrir Square, we turned the kingdom of Solomon upside down. Morning horizon, new world order, excellent wine from the house of Atum al-Haq, carried by the light of our living martyr saints. Free peoples of the world, declare a change of regime. Down with tyranny, injustice, and torture. Release all prisoners from black dungeons. Stop the killing and looting. Stop planting social disorder. Upper and lower, Egypt united as one. Egyptians declare a change of regime. Life, health, prosperity, like sunshine, belongs to all. No more apartheid wall. Thank you. Enjoy the film. Um, but I hope that all of you will stay for the discussion and there's a lot to discuss. I want to welcome um, to the stage Professor Rhonda Sirhan, who takes her seat as moderator, because she has the handheld mic sitting in her chair. She is director of the Arab Studies Program and assistant professor in the Department of Sociology. She received her BA from American University of Beirut and MA from the University of Windsor, and a PhD master's in philosophy and MA from Columbia University. Her research and teaching focuses on democratization, immigration to the United States, and the sociology of exclusion and social movements. 
Her recent publications include Palestinian Weddings, Inventing Palestine in New Jersey. <laughs> I'm sure that that was probably pretty fun. Um, and American Democracy and the Pursuit of Equality. We're very pleased that she'll be moderating the panel tonight. Um, in addition, Professor Shadi Mohtari, who's the assistant professor at the School of International Service, where she specializes in human rights, Middle East politics, and political Islam. She received her BA from American University, and an MIA or an MA? Is it a typo? Okay, all right, because MIA means something different to me. Um, from Columbia University, a JD from the University of Texas, and a PhD and LLM from York University. These are women who uh, have studied a lot. Um, lots of degrees between them. She's the editor-in-chief of the Muslim World Journal of Human Rights and is currently working on a project mapping how human rights dynamics and discourses have changed in the Middle East since the recent wave of popular protests and demand for change. Karim El-Hakim, I think, now needs no introduction. You missed the wow reaction uh, when the credits rolled. Um, in addition to the work that he did on this film, he's contributed to numerous award-winning political documentaries about the Middle East, including films that we have actually screened at the law school repeatedly, uh, My Trip to Al-Qaeda, Jiran, is that how I pronounce it? Um, and Egypt, We're Watching You. He was also a contributing editor uh, on Control Room. We are so privileged and so proud to have you here, to have screened your film, you. and to have this discussion. Uh, Rhonda, I leave it to you. Um, this is on, right? I think it's on. So I'm going to take the privilege of being the moderator to um, field you speak the first a little question. Closer. Yeah, sorry, I'm go. sick today. To field the first question, um, and then open it up to Dr. Shadi, and then, of course, to the audience. But what I would like to start with is that um, I felt this film played two important roles. One is to chronicle these very tense moments. And I, I think I'm not alone in saying that um, the, the sense, that sense of exhilaration and panic and confusion was clearly presented. I felt the sen every sentiment that went with it. So that was beautiful. The second, which is more about the characters, you and your friends. And this is, um, you know, one of the questions is, how do you identify yourself? Do you see yourself as an activist or as in um, a, just a filmmaker? And then there are a couple other things where you're giving voice to a group that's often marginalized, yet elite. And so you, how do you position yourself as the storyteller um, in, in this story in particular, and especially since there was a huge tension between participant and observer? So if I could start with that. Good question. Um, actually, we are normal people where we were not particularly involved in the revolution outside of doing this film. Uh, we were down in Tahrir Square. We were pro-revolution. We still are pro-revolution. Um, but at, at the same time, we're, we're not, that was not our, our prime ob objective. I mean, we got caught up in um, all of the movement that was happening. And of course, we wanted to see Egypt liberated from a dictatorship. And we still do. And the dictatorship is still there, even though the dictator has fall, fallen. Um, so there's a lot of work to do. And I think my contribution to the, f to the revolution was really was making this movie and uh, coming out to, to show it to people like you to spread awareness about what is really happening in Egypt and that it is um, not over and that it continues to move forward. And um, so, you know, at, Obviously, uh, I think if, if you were a filmmaker, you're probably a really, real, like, hardcore filmmaker, okay, this is the most important thing in my life, then I probably would have stayed. And if I hadn't had a family with me, I certainly would have. But uh, there are things that trump uh, making a movie, and, and uh, certainly our personal safety was, was really uh, much more important. And obviously, having a one-year-old son uh, and having tear gas you know, floating into his bedroom is not a good idea. Uh, so ultimately, we had to f we had to leave, and also we had to leave because we felt the pressure coming down and closing closing around us. Uh, we had to leave with our f with our footage. We had to save the film. Uh, so <clears throat> these things all kind of motivated us to be involved to a point. Um, I've gotten some criticism uh, 
from people in the Middle East that are pro-revolution, well, you left and you abandoned the revolution and stuff like that. But I, I, don't, I disagree. I think that um, there's no point in dying on the street uh, when you can, uh, if you're smart enough, you know when to leave the battleground and when to come back to it. Um, and in a sense, that's what we've done with this film. Um, to the second part of your question, and this is really going into filmmaking, is, is what's exciting about this film is that we've blurred the lines between the, object, uh, the observer and the participant. Um, we've crossed the line, we've melded them together. Um, sometimes in the film you hear different voices of different characters holding the camera. Uh, so it was very much a collective effort. Um, and it became natural to turn the cameras around and be involved in the film because in a way the documentary is a film about people making a film, uh, very indirectly. Uh, but it's also about the phenomenon of the emotional space that was being repeated all over the city. So we had to, we had to kind of cross the line to be able to, to show um, what was emotionally happening to us. You know, we couldn't remove ourselves from being behind the camera, in front of the camera, so everything just became mixed together. And I think that, you know, that's what actually makes it a unique film. Can I just probe you, in, can I probe you on that a little bit, especially since this is an academic audience and students are trying to learn about this part of the world. And you weren't just there as filmmakers or just happened to be caught up in something. You're living there. And so that's more of the position I was thinking about. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the perceptions are there's only one type of people there, but you are another type of people that's there, and I think that's more what I was looking for, like, what's your position in this? Um, because you go from, yes, I'm an outsider, but there's these almost nationalism at points where you want them to succeed, and you say this is home. So home and outsider. No, of course. I mean, we, I'm Egyptian. My father's Egyptian. We come from a very old family. Um, of artists and writers and architects and uh, people who have contributed to the cultural, uh, let's say, fabric of, of Egypt and the Middle East. Uh, my father grew up under King Farouk, you know. Uh, he was uh, very much an aristocratic uh, type of person. My grandmother was the, the daughter of a pasha who was uh, the chef de cabinet for the king. Uh, for uh, Abbas Helmi II, actually the Khedive Abbas Helmi II, who was the, the last legitimate ruler of Egypt before the British came and deposed him and installed King Fuad. So we do have a long history in Egypt. We are definitely from, I would say, the elites of, of old school Egypt, which were Francophones and Anglophones and even Turcophones uh, going, going back a hundred years. Um, so it's, it, I claim Egypt as my home, even though I grew up in America. And of course, there's an identity conflict, an identity, uh, you know, uh, clash of identities, uh, where you know I'm a white guy with a black name uh, in America, <laughs> so I don't really fit here, nor do I really fit there. Uh, so I've always kind of grown up in between cultures, and it's been a really a, a, upon my own kind of you know effort to really claim my stake. Uh, so that, that's interesting, and if you notice in the, f the first scene of the film, that was the last scene that we edited. That was done really at the last day and last moments we, we f completed that scene because that was a difficult scene to really set the stage of who is involved in this film, why are they there, what, what are they doing, what is their history. And it didn't make sense to say, well, this American guy, and well, he happens to be named Kareem, and, and there's a Danish guy, but he's Omar, and it, you know, it didn't make any sense. So we had to say, kind of spell it out and say, you know, Kareem, he's Egyptian, but he, was, he grew up in America. Omar, he's Palestinian, but he grew up in Denmark. And create these very, like, clear lines about who we are, that we are cross-cultural, that we're international people, but that we have Arab roots, and we have a responsibility to our Arab roots to... To, to be with it, to, to have this nationalism, and it justified why we're there and what we're doing. Right, thank you, I actually really appreciated that um, clarification. And I just turn it over to Dr. Mukhtari. Thank you very much, um, and thank you, Karim, uh, for your work. Uh, you know, if you have um, 
been to Egypt since the revolution, uh, one of the things that really stands out is the, the graffiti everywhere. Um, and, and just unbelievable kind of artistic talent and expression in this graffiti, this, uh, uh, I think, integral part of, of the revolution. Um, and when I went to Egypt um, in the summer of 2011, uh, one of the slogans that I saw uh, several places in Cairo was, all it took was 19 days. And this past summer, when I went back to Cairo, I didn't see that graffiti anymore. Um, and I think it does kind of speak to this transformation um, or this realization um, that, you know, Egyptians are in it for the long haul. Um, and I think the title Half Revolution is very apt. I mean, when you speak to Egyptians, you know, it was the revolution. Um, and uh, when you speak to political scientists, you know, it's something short of a revolution. Um, I, I think there's a duality here, actually. Um, I think what was achieved in 19 days was the hard part, really. I mean, was because you had to transcend something really mentally. Um, and the determination that kind of emerges from those 19 days then carries on to, to, to the battles that ensue and that are ongoing. Um, and, and so, you know, I think, yes, it wasn't 19 days and it wasn't all summed up in, in Mubarak, but at the same time, uh, what happened in those 19 days was very significant. And as I was saying to friends in, in Cairo over the summer who were complaining about, you know, the scaf and, and saying that it, what we have is really no different than Mubarak. And, and I said, you know, from my, my background being Iranian American, uh, what you achieved by overthrowing Mubarak, I would love to have in Iran. I'll take any day and we'll keep fighting it. So um, I think that's what like, I'd like to start with. Well, I'll, I'll just comment on that because um, actually, I, I would disagree. I, I think that the easiest part of, of, of this revolution was, in fact, taking Mubarak out. Uh, why? Because uh, everybody was united against one, united in one cause. We had one target. We're all all of us: Salafis, liberals, brotherhood, youth, unions, students. Everyone was united against this. You know, against uh, sorry for this particular cause of taking out the dictator. Now that he's gone, all of these different voices are fractured, and uh, everybody is, you know, clamoring for for attention and trying to get their piece of the pie and, and power games and all this stuff. So it's a big mess, and there's not really any uh, cohesive uh, opposition party. Obviously, the Brotherhood is in power now. They didn't have. They didn't start the revolution. They did play a part in the revolution, but they also betrayed the revolution for their own selfish interests. And so I think you're going to see slow mobilization of the revolutionary parties to essentially become, and probably elements of the old regime will actually join the revolution against the Brotherhood. And the Brotherhood really, you know, has a lot of work to do, and uh, they haven't really done anything. So there's a lot of frustration in the street. Um, there's a lot of confusion who's in control and you know it's going to take time to stabilize and move forward and really continue the revolution which is essentially you know the, the brotherhood is part of the old regime they've been around for a hundred years they're gumming up all of the bureaucracy inside the uh, the government and they've monopolized many of the institutions of the country uh, long before the revolution uh, even began so there's a lot of cleaning to do and I think, you know, part of that thing is really getting that, uniting that one, that voice, you know, that is the revolutionary voice and having that continue to be strong and not divided. And of course, every day and every week as we move forward, there are more and more attempts to continue to divide us, divide and conquer, uh, divide Christians from Muslims, from secularists and Islamists, uh, from old uh, generation to younger generation, um, constantly. Uh, but, you know, we've, we've lived so, through so many dirty tricks that we, we all kind of understand, you know, the, the nature of the beast that we're up against. And uh, as we persevere and we move through all of these attempts to divide us, we just, we just ultimately get stronger. Yeah, I mean, I, I think your last point is pretty much where I'm coming from on this in, in the sense that, 
you know, another hyphenated American is Anthony, the late Anthony Shadid. Um, and he did make it to Tahrir Square uh, before he passed away last year. And he speaks of just the power of imagination, of Egyptians being t able to imagine something different. Um, and I think there is, you know, I guess in, in political science terms, we can say a normative shift that has taken place vis-a-vis uh, -vis the relationship of the population to, to, to repression. And so it doesn't matter if, you know, once you've, you've brought Mubarak down, it's, you're still, <laughs> it's the same paradigm when you're talking about the SCAF or you're talking about the Muslim Brotherhood. So I think it's that kind of experience of the revolution and then the determination to not let that slip that, that I find, you know, gives me a lot of hope. Absolutely. I mean, the, the main, really, I would say the, the biggest accomplishment of the revolution was breaking down the fear barrier, the wall of fear, destroying fear, being fearless. Um, and once we attained the fearlessness, the police were just whoop, swept aside. There was no stopping it. I, I, I like to call it the human tsunami because it just is unstoppable. And once we tasted that and we had that power, um, it's something never to be forgotten. And as you said, with the graffiti, um, there's just been an explosion of expression that's been so suppressed for the last 30 years in all different uh, uh, expressive media. I mean, not just uh, graffiti, but political rap and music and filmmaking and um, poetry, theater, uh, arts festivals, street festivals. Um, people are not looking for permission anymore. And that's a beautiful thing. And I think that's going to continue to grow and it's going to mature. And, you know, th this is something that is long overdue. Um, you have 50% of the country under the age of 25, and they really, literally, they have no hope, they have no future, they have no education, they have very little job prospects. Uh, so a lot of them are funneling their energies into creative expression, which is beautiful and, and amazing to see and very inspiring. Uh, and it's going down to the very young kids. It's not just uh, the 25-year-olds, it's going down to 14-year-olds, 10-year-olds, um, even the street kids are getting into art and people are helping them and trying to, to re rehabilitate them. And I think if this continues, then, you know, we will have kind of a social, we'll have some social leverage against all of these kind of barriers of, of, that have been set up and that are part of uh, the old regime, part of the Muslim Brotherhood. Part of, the, part of them is telling you how to dress, what to do, what you can't do, what you can do, who you can stand with, who you can't stand with, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. And these things are, you know, they're just barriers that are, are slowly being torn down. So once they are, and once they continue to be torn down, um, they won't have any kind of moral uh, authority over us anymore. And in fact, we'll be the ones with the moral authority. And we, we, we are, because the street um, when I say we, I mean the revolution, because really the street is the most legitimate political power in Egypt, and I would, I would argue certainly um, in any of the Arab Spring moments, um, it's the people, it's people power, and we've seen the power of that, and it continues, and it's, it's a reminder, we, we, showing this film to people in Egypt is always a reminder of the power of, that they have, so it's very important that people see the film, and we are showing it more in Egypt, and there are more and more films coming out that are reminding people of that every day. Um, actually, I just want to ask, you've been back, obviously. Since. Yeah, we just left for a couple months to let, let the, the dust settle, and uh, then we, we, we went back and then spent about three, four months in Denmark uh, editing the film, and we've been back ever since, you know. And one other question, because you're saying it's hopeful, and you know, just for the students again, because of um, like social movement theory and stuff, that it's the people power, but the people's power is to remove something. The people's power can be expressed, but people m lose momentum if there's not organizing. And so now that you're back, do you see that maybe they are taking that moment to organize? So while the Muslim Brotherhood or whoever is in control, people who didn't have a chance to organize are organizing now. Do you see that as the case? Yeah, it's slowly coming back because I think people understand that they can't stand uh, on their own sort of narrow platforms at the moment. 
we all have to kind of unite and find common ground. And um, yeah, it's happening. It's happening slowly, but you know, got to be patient. <laughs> well, um, I guess one more point I could make that you know we're sitting here in Washington D.C. <laughs> um, the role of the United States in all of this and, and the relationship to, to U.S. power. I mean, I think. Um, a lot of people um, involved, not just in the Egyptian uh, revolution, but, but the various uprisings in the, in the region would tell you that it wasn't about the U.S. You know, it, this time it was not about the U.S., it was about us. Um, but I, I argue that there is, you know, indirectly <laughs> a response to U.S. foreign policy that is coming out of these revolutions. Um, and, 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 you know, again, this power of imagination and, and before the perception being of the all-powerful, you know, um, Egyptian security apparatus, but then also behind the Mubarak regime, the all-powerful United States, you know, the hegemon. Um, and I think that's another kind of mental barrier that was broken, at least in the Egyptian case, and that ultimately forced a change to foreign policy in the, in, by the United States towards Egypt. Um, but that hasn't necessarily translated to other parts of the Middle East. Um, and so, you know, uh, we have a different story. We have the, you know, the old um, U.S. attempt to balance uh, Middle Eastern people's rights with American interests, <laughs> you know, uh, when they speak of balancing rights and interests. So we have that in Bahrain. We had that with Yemen to an extent. Um, and so uh, another point to think about as we're sitting here in Washington, D.C., thinking about the Egyptian revolution. I was, some of my favorite parts of the film are, you know, the guy going, America! You know, he's just, just so indignant and so, you know, infuriated by, um, uh, you know, all this tear gas and shotgun shells that, you know, manufactured in Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, this was just another uh, piece of evidence that told the people on the street, hey man, this tear gas made in USA. And even when Cameron came, uh, for example, David Cameron, he came to congratulate the Egyptian people and took a tour of Tahrir Square. And meanwhile, was doing arms deals uh, with the army to sell them fresh tear gas. This is, this is what's happening. You have this double standard. And, you know, ultimately, America needs to change its policy in the Middle East. It cannot afford to support another dictatorship. And I mean that across the board. Uh, there's more than uh, just uh, Muslim countries in the Middle East. And that relationship has to change because ultimately it's going to bite us in the ass if it doesn't. Just to follow up, I mean, one other thing that came up uh, that was very interesting was how acutely aware they are of the U.S.'s role. So it wasn't just this anti-Americanism for, you know, for its sake, but somebody was actually saying, one of the, one of the people that you're talking to is saying, well, because Hosni Mubarak is basically you know, an ally, was an ally, and look what he did to us. So there is a direct, there's an indirect relationship, but they understand you know, where the leadership of, of, um, of Egypt was getting parts of its power. So it's not this anti, because in, we sit in the US and everyone thinks, you know, everyone's just anti-American, they don't understand us, but actually even the simple man in the street understands something about the power play that's going on in, in his own country. And I think you, you, um, you portrayed that very nicely. But uh, if you don't have anything else, I'd like to open it up to the, to the audience. Uh, any questions? Uh, comment on what uh, questions. Um, uh, I'm Ismail Alexandroni in Arabic, El Iskandroni. I'm an uh, Egyptian uh, researcher. My scope is uh, political sociology, social media, post Islamism, and these areas. Uh, and I have uh, just arrived to do my fellowship uh, on social media and differentiating uh, using social media as a platform for freedom of speech or, or utilizing it as, as a tool of mobilization in Egypt and trying to. Uh, make a comparative uh, approach to deal with this uh, stuff. So uh, I have just arrived a few days from Egypt. Uh, I, uh, uh, and I have uh, two comments. Uh, this uh, this uh, document, uh, documentary have two, uh, has two uh, aspects, the artistic one and the documentation one. On the, uh, on the artistic level, it's a very good, it's a very 
well done uh, documentary. I congratulate you, and I wish you the best in, uh, uh, for your career as a filmmaker. And uh, uh, if I may uh, comment that um, uh, this this dilemma of uh, subjectivity and objectivity, it's uh, um, it's. Uh, uh, it's overcome. It, it has been overcome uh, uh, during the social media activities uh, among the, the within the uh, past uh, years. The activist who carry his uh, mobile cam and uh, uh, taking the, taking a part of the demonstration or the activity and uh, documenting what is happening, he 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 isn't uh, he he. He doesn't have to answer the question of the objectivity and subjectivity. So it's it's uh, it's about history. It's uh, uh, it, uh, let's say it's the uh, 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 past century uh, uh, issue. Yeah, and we are we are now um, dealing with the uh, the filmmaker or the activist, the the journalist as a as a citizen, as a part of the uh, as an actor, not as, as just. Uh, uh, director or something like that. Uh, the, the second um, the second comment, and, and please uh, and accept my criticism, uh, that this uh, this is not a have revolution. It's a have documentary, because uh, you have the right to live and your for and for your reasons, which is very much appreciated and so on. But uh, the uh, the last. The last half minute in, in your uh, documentary is very misleading, because the scaf is is over. Is the scaf rule uh, is over by the elected president, who is uh, who I, I didn't support by the way, but he kicked them out in August 12th uh, by the, uh, his decisions and so on. Uh, I I maybe agree with you if you mean that revolution doesn't um, or hasn't uh, achieved its demands yet. Yes, I agree with you. So it, it's, it's still an a, 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 ongoing revolution. It, 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 isn't, it isn't over. But, but it, uh, not in this way. In this way, it's a half documentary, not a half revolution. Thank, thank you. Um, I would comment on that because um, it's not a half documentary. It's a, it's a full documentary about half a story. And the idea is that the documentary is not about the complete general uh, description of the revolution. When, when, when is the revolution over? It might take 10 years. So this story is a personal story. This story is about our personal experience. This story is not about the revolution. This story is about a group of people stuck inside the revolution. And we see from beginning to end how they deal with it. That's the documentary. There is no explicit documentary that has been done to this date that it's going to tell you the whole story of the, document, of, the, of the revolution. If you see that film, it's probably going to be on TV or on the news. And it's going to have absolutely no emotion in it. It's going to be all about facts and dates. That's not the kind of film I, I'm interested in making. The, f the, the strength of this film is the emotional space of the people. It's a human story. It's what happens to them. Not what happens to Egypt, not what happens to Mubarak, not what happens to Scaf. And just to, make your, to point out that this film was done um, eight months after January 25th, 2011. We finished it in September 2011. So we finished it a year ago, a, uh, nine months before Morsi was elected. OK? So obviously, it's only dealing with the time frame that it's in. It was shot over 11 consecutive days. That's it. I like to make films that are very, very narrow in their scope. The more specific, the better. I don't like general stories and big topics. This is a huge topic, but told from a very, very narrow point of view. And the more human it can be, the better and more compelling it is to watch. 
I don't claim to tell you the, you know, the complete story of the revolution with this film. So. Can I just follow up on that? Um, I think it's an important question that you asked because I, I think it, uh, it was more about what is the meaning of the title of this film. And I think you took it, you assumed what the meaning was and you assumed that it was saying this is only half a revolution because somehow there was failure or there's judgment. And I don't think you're judging the revolution. And actually, even in the social sciences, we only judge revolutions when they're done. After something is done, we're like, oh, that, that was a revolution. But in the moment, you don't know. And I don't think you are passing judgment. Um, but I'm glad that you asked the question because then you got to tell us what it was that your, um, y your purpose was and why you called it half a revolution. It's not done. It's an ongoing story. Yeah. Um, we have one more question. Yes. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Okay? There. Um, well, thank you for the uh, <laughs> wonderful <laughs> film. Oh, my name is Jason Shulman. Um, my question is about gender dynamics in the film. There's a couple of moments that were really interesting. One is when you're filming from up, upstairs and there's a uh, thug and he says, kill that whore. And then there's one where o I think Omar's fiance says, please leave, you know, it's getting dangerous. And then your wife is very nervous and you say, we're not going to go out tonight. And then the most powerful for me was when you told your son, don't cry, be a man. Can you talk a little about sort of the gender dynamics going on in Cairo? Uh, I've never heard that question, so I, I guess I'll make a comment on it, but um, I don't know. I mean, um, you know, these are tense moments and people are asserting themselves in, in different ways and, and, you know, it was interesting to see how, for example, um, my favorite scene in the film is when my wife is in the middle of, of Talat Harb Square surrounded by guys and she's announcing that, hey, the army's coming in and nobody knew. And um, uh, that, that uncertainty, hey, is the army with us or against us? People didn't know. Uh, that was beautiful. And then, you know, telling them, hey, man, you got to be here every day. We got to continue, continue, continue. What do you mean the whole country's going to come to a standstill? She's like, look, are you kidding me? There's no food and no jobs anyway. And then they just became completely quiet, you know, silent. A woman silencing a group of men in this situation. That was just fantastic. You know, for me, that was one of my favorite scenes. And this is unusual. Usually it's the other way around. Um, so I think there's some role reversals happening. And then there's also traditional uh, roles that get more defined as the pressure builds. You know, Samah, she's concerned about where's the food and where we're going to get milk for the baby and what do you want to eat. And, um, you know, th these, I think, were just kind of products of the pressures around us. Um, I can't say anything more about that. Can I just, I, I'd love to add, um, actually, I saw something also in your wife that maybe as a Palestinian woman, I'm like, that's a Palestinian woman right there. When she was like telling you, I'll take care of it, you can go home, you know. If you need to hide, you hide. I'm gonna go get us some food. And so I didn't see a terrible gender dynamic, you know, or like disparity. I thought, you know, there was quite a bit of um, something going on there yeah. that was interesting. So please go ahead. Well, if I could just actually add one thing to it, uh, more generally, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion of whether the revolution was good for women or bad for women, and I and I would say that from the experience of the Iranian revolution, um, the revolution politicizes women, brings women out to the public square, and then once it's over, um, particularly Islamists would like women to go back <laughs> to the you know home and, and the private domain, and that doesn't happen, and women stay kind of in the public sphere, and they continue um, kind of at the fore of politics and trying to find ways into. Uh, political structures and, and decision making in the public sphere. Um, and so it's a long kind of, the battle is, is a long run marathon type battle for women along with the revolution. Um, but I think it's positive. Great. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, my name is Rami Yacoub. I'm a graduate student here at AU. But more importantly, I'm Egyptian and I actually went back to Egypt when you were leaving. Uh, and I stayed there for a year and a half. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you for two things. Number one, your first half of the movie definitely captures the horrific uh, conditions that you're in on the ground. I was injured a few times on the ground in protests, not in the first 18 days, but later on. Uh, and thank you for also noting that clashes continue to go on. 
Uh, actually, I was kind of disappointed that you said uh, in, in the comment uh, there that, uh, or in response, that you're not criticizing the revolution because a lot of us see it as half a revolution. Uh, yes, for you, maybe it's a half of the story of the 18 days, which is eloquently placed, but also, um, no, it, it's not complete. Uh, absolutely not. We did not achieve what we had tried to achieve, and it's uh, no uh, on point. And the second comment I wanted, actually, three comments, quick comments, two more. Uh, the second one is, uh, it is great that you've captured uh, the dynamics between loved ones uh, during clashes, because this is something that we as friends, and uh, I was there with, away from my family, my family's in Canada, but my friends, and that you consider them family, you're always concerned. There's always the guy that wants to go out there and shoot some more footage. And then there's the person who's like, you're crazy, stay in, inside. But you know, that's excellent that you captured that. Finally, uh, the comment actually about the scene that you're talking about with your wife in Talat Harp Square. I noticed your wife has a little bit of a non-Egyptian accent speaking Arabic. Um, and I noticed that the xenophobia had not kicked in yet. Uh, and I'm glad that you captured that because there's a clear divide when uh, state-sponsored state propaganda was then targeting uh, people like yourself or other people who don't, even though might be Egyptian, might not have like the most fluent of Egyptian accents. Uh, but yeah, so it's uh, great work. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, uh, my wife is Palestinian, so she's very used to this kind of uh, turmoil. I've never seen her more happy, actually. <laughs> she's, she felt right at home with all of this. It's like, oh, yeah, don't worry, it's normal. F F-16, shh, you know. I was amazed at her, her comfort zone. Um, but no, actually, I mean, part of the point of the title of the film uh, was really for us to counter the Western perceptions uh, that the revolution was done. Fait accompli, Mubarak fell, great, yay, Egypt, cool, 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 great, great, new country, everything's good. You know, it's the farthest thing from the truth. So we, we early on in the editing process, we, de we defined the title and we sort of fulfilled our edit to live up to the title. Uh, we wanted to get that story out there and we wanted make, to make people quite aware that it was in the middle of, a, we're in, still in the middle of a, of a revolution. It's not finished. It's not a cozy and, and neat little ending. And we, we achieved that. People at Sundance and, and the, the European Film Festival started to respond to that. And in fact, many of the journalists that were covering Egypt started using the term half revolution. And um, so we, we accomplished what we set out to do uh, in terms of the title. Um, okay. um, here, I think here. You, you were waiting on the right here. Sorry, you don't mind? You there. Sorry. Thanks. Um, I, uh, oh, I was, first of all, happy to know that there's an Iranian-American here, like me. <laughs> um, and uh, actually, I plan to travel across North Africa early next year. Um, it's been a dream of mine for many years. And um, so I, I, I wanted to blog the whole time. And I'm, uh, I want to capture um, this sense of empowerment among just uh, everyday people and or either everyday, both everyday people and um, those who actually work in nonprofits, and uh, and I and I really appreciate what you said um, just now about uh, how how even people of all ages uh, and all backgrounds are using creativity to sort of explore their own empowerment and and think of new possibilities for the future. So I'm wondering if, I know this is really broad, I don't even know how to ask this question, but I, I just, I'm just trying to gather ideas of where I should look or um, if you have any suggestions for what I should blog about or any focus or, and, and also like, I, I don't speak Arabic, uh, a little of Persian and, and French. I'm wondering if that's, uh, because in the, in the film there was some, um, that uh, the, was it the French guy who speaks fluent Arabic and the only reason why he didn't get his butt kicked is because yeah. he did. So I'm just, I'm just wondering how I can stay safe too, but anyway, well, <laughs> thank I think you. you should, I think you should just, you know, just go there and see where it takes you. Um, there's so much to talk about in terms of the arts and um, the role of women, uh, mobilizing, uh, you know, there's increasing poverty. It's already been, you know, it's already been a mess before the revolution. 
Uh, people live on less than a dollar a day. Um, there's so much to talk about. You just have to go there. It's safe. You have to be aware of your surroundings and be, you know, careful where, where you go. But I wouldn't, I would say don't be afraid and just let it come to you. You know, this just, there's an ocean of possibilities there. Just put yourself there. Yeah? Okay. Um, I'm Hind. Uh, I'm Egyptian. I'm here for an exchange program. Um, actually, I lived all my life in Egypt. Uh, but unfortunately, I had a planned trip on the 25th of January 2011, so I was out of the country for five days. And then uh, I had difficulty going back because there were no flights going back to Egypt. So I stayed like almost all the revolution, not in Egypt. So I would really like to thank you so much for that documentary because it really gave me a new meaning. And because what we saw on TV wasn't like the truth that happened. So you gave me another and different new perspective for what happened. Um, another question for you is, what do you think of the presidential elections? Is it like, do you think this is like the first new step for a transition to democracy? And do you think the Muslim Brotherhood are gonna prove and like make people <coughs> speak freely and like have democracy in the country? So that's the question, thank you. Thank you. Where did you go when you were out of the country? Oh, excuse me? Where did you go? Dubai, okay. <laughs> well, um, uh, thank you very much. I mean, I think, you know, my opinion is that I, I, I am opposed to Morsi, but I stand next to him in saluting him as the first civilian to be elected ever in, e in the entire history of Egypt in 7,000 years. Uh, but I'm his opposition. This is good for the country. I think plurality is a good thing. Uh, the country's always been monopolized and dominated by one force or another. There's never been a plurality which essentially is allowed to thrive, and I think that's a good thing for the country. The Muslim Brotherhood is nothing new. Egypt is one of the most religious countries I've ever been to without it being forced on you. And I think it will continue to be that way. Um, I, I Honestly, I think as time plays out, I think it's going to be quite clear that the Brotherhood doesn't have the capability to run the country. Um, you know, it, I think that they're transitional. I don't think they're going to stick around for very long. Who's going to come next? I'm not sure. But I think that um, the, the next six years will allow the opposition to grow and grow and grow. And hopefully in the next election, it will be a clean election. And there will be some legitimate opposition that will take more seats in parliament and if not the presidency itself. <coughs> So I'm optimistic. I think it's just going to take a bit of time. Well, um, I, I would just add that I don't think, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood lives in a vacuum from the, the changes that are going on around them. And you see the Muslim Brotherhood adopting a lot of the language of rights and democracy. And yes, they do it in very broad, opaque ways. Um, but that gives avenues <laughs> that creates openings for human rights activists to constantly be engaging them and shaming them when necessary and, and you know, engaging in processes of dialogue. So, you know, I, I, one of the things I was looking at over the summer was Salafists and Islamists on the Human Rights Committee of the Parliament, of the new Parliament. And it was fascinating how, you know, some of the Salafists, you know, started on day one saying, why do we have a Human Rights Committee? This is a Western construct, you know. And then the learning process that goes on where, some, you know, one of the secular MPs insists, let's get out, you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so then the Salafists are studying the Declaration and then you have um, witness uh, uh, victims come and testify as witnesses in the hearings. And, and so it's a very interesting kind of um, interaction that takes shape and it's, uh, it goes both ways in a, in a sense because I also interviewed um, a feminist activist who said, I asked, you know, do you engage with, with Islamists or the Muslim Brotherhood? And they would say, why would we do that? We know what they think. You know, that's a waste of time. But now that they're in parliament, they have to engage with them. Um, and so they say, yes, we engage institutions and we held, you know, all these meetings. And so I think, you know, it's a very interesting time and, and um, the Islamists of today are not 
the, is, you know, the Islamists of 1979 in Iran. And so it's very interesting. Actually, one of the most powerful images that, that came out of the revolution for me was just after the Maspero massacre, uh, where I think it was around 30 mainly Copts, but there were Muslims that also died, uh, were you know, run over by tanks and shot by AKs and bodies dumped in the river uh, by, the, by the military. Uh, after that happened, there was a protest, obviously, against that. And one of the most powerful images I, I can remember is a Salafi being held up on the shoulders of a group of Copts holding up a Bible. And this is exactly what Islam is. Islam is, you are, we are commanded by the, the Quran to protect minorities. We are commanded to take care of the people who cannot defend themselves. And this is a very important part of Islam. And this is a part of Islam that the Salafis, I think, let's say, the, uh, the ones not blinded by extremism, uh, understand that role, that they need to protect minorities, that they need to stand up for them. And if they don't, it's a sin. Simple as that. So there, there is a part of the Salafi movement that you know, is getting back to the basis, basics of Islam. Some of it I don't like, some of it I love. Uh, it's a very complicated issue. But in his action of holding up the Bible and being trumpeted and held up by, by Copts, he is saying, hey, these are human rights. We need to protect them. We need to protect these people. And I stand with them to protect them. And so Egypt's a very complicated place, but it's very simple. And I think everybody get this. They really get this. So human rights, whatever you want to call it, it's been written down and it's been existing for, you know, a thousand years or more. Hi, I'm a first year uh, film student here at American and I have a twofold question. Um, uh, as someone who, uh, obviously identifies as Egyptian, but also has roots also in America by having grown up here. I just wanted to know your perspective on, um, I don't know if you've, you've obviously heard about the film Innocence of Muslims and the uproar it's causing in the Middle East um, amongst the Muslim community. Uh, I wanted to know what your thoughts are on First Amendment um, rights, well, the rights to free speech and where like where the balance should exist between um, being able to express um, whatever opinion you have, however vile it may be, and um, uh, even if that is, even if your motive is to incite some kind of um, emotional, visceral um, reaction in, in the audience, and also um, your, your perspective on helping Americans understand um, why the reaction amongst Muslims and in the Middle East are so universally um, similarly angry at the film because I feel like maybe here in America we're so kind of uh, jaded and kind of um, overwhelmed by so many uh, obscene things that it just uh, doesn't affect us as much but um, just wanted to know your perspective, especially as someone who is Egyptian and also American. Okay, good question. When you see a swastika painted on a wall, graffitied on a wall, what is that? What is that presented to you? What does that equate to you? In America, we call it a hate crime. That's what it is. So is that film. So are the cartoons done in the Danish cartoons. These are hate crimes. They were intended to offend people. They're intended to incite violence. Uh, the Supreme Court is actually quite clear on this. If you yell fire in a crowded theater, uh, that's a crime. That, that's not uh, freedom of expression. So I, I think it's the same. I equate, equate it with the same thing. And I think there's a double standard when it comes to um, Muslims and the perception of Muslims in America and uh, the, the perception of our fellow Semites uh, Jewish people in America. Uh, we've been conditioned as Americans to be highly sensitive about how we talk about Jews or portray, portray uh, 
uh, Jews, and I agree with that. I think it's, I think it's important. But you cannot um, have one standard applied to one community and then have that same standard thrown out when it comes to another community. You have to stand very clear that it affects everybody equally. So I think also when it comes to the reaction, you have to understand that protest itself uh, in, the, in the Muslim world has been suppressed for so long that people don't, they're not mature enough to understand the dynamics of what protest is. They're not comfortable enough to do, uh, to kind of be able to protest and hear, hear their voice without having a violent component to it. It's, it's still, I would say, a still an immature um, reality for them in many cases, you know. But at the same time, we have to be careful to understand that just like in Italy and Greece and Spain, that you have provocateurs who are in the crowd, who are there to burn and break things and get into fights with police to essentially delegitimize the actual protest movement. And that's part of what we saw in uh, the reaction to this film in the Arab world. And I think it's interesting, too, because we have to understand that we're in a war of media. We're in a war of wor words. And um, in a sense, the Arab Spring, leading up before the Arab Spring, we've had 10 years of, of, of George Bush and Cheney and the neocons and a Zionist agenda that has demonized Muslims in the American media for the last 10 years. All of a sudden, the Arab Spring comes along and Americans are rooting for them because, hey, they want freedom, they want democracy. Hey, well, we love that, you know? And this is like a quote from Obama. We need to raise American kids like young Egyptians, you know? <laughs> so all of that 10 years of work of demonization of Muslims would just whew, down the toilet. Now all of a sudden America is like, hey, we really respect them. So this reaction out of the American media is that in my, my opinion, is that it's resetting uh, the status quo. It's reset, resetting Muslim equals bad guy, Muslim equals savage, Muslim equals terrorist. That has been perpetuated since uh, the beginning, since 9-11. Okay? So that's my take on it. Can I just inject something about, I mean, since we've been talking a little bit about or quite a bit about religion and human rights, it's not about and just tempering the Muslim Brotherhood or the Salafis to give people personal freedoms. Remember, the, Egypt, the Egyptian population has been suffering because the welfare state was dismantled. Their free education, their free health care was being taken away. Everything's being privatized. So we've not said anything about the economy or very little. You mentioned that people are very poor. But so the Muslim Brotherhood or whoever takes over not only has to deal with morality and personal freedoms, that's more, that's absolutely important, but the basic human right and dignity of all people is to be able to provide for themselves and for their kids. And I don't think, I think this is the biggest test of whoever comes into power and if they can hold on to power is can they provide for the Egyptian people? Because the Muslim Brotherhood, um, they're neoliberal in many ways. Um, they're, they have no problem with doing uh, business with big business. And you know, that's part of the story that we haven't spoken about at all. Um, but back to you. Hi, I first want to thank you for the film. Uh, it was very moving. Um, my question, uh, it seems a lot of reflection today is about how we can finish the revolution. Is it halfway to its completion? What would a revolution's completeness look like? Um, and to me, the more interesting question seems to be, how can we prevent the revolution from finishing? Um, how, how can we prevent the revolution from ever finishing? How can we keep it open-ended? How can we keep a half-revolution? Um, a revolution's power, to me, seems to be its deinstitutionalizing, these uh, detotalizing movements of the, of the revolution. And already we can see movements of re-totalizing, re-institutionalization. Um, my question is, how do you see um, a kind of open-endedness in the revolution? How do we keep open that open-endedness? You want me to answer? I can answer. Um, you can't keep an, a revolution open-ended, and why would you want to? The whole point of a revolution is to revolutionize, right? To change the system so it's better and more equitable. But you can't continue a revolution endlessly because people get exhausted, resources get exhausted, people will eventually just 
remove themselves. And those who keep going are the ones that are going to take over. So why would you want to continue a revolution? Unless what you're saying is, I don't like where it is right now, and we, can, we need to keep going until we find the right one for us, or the right one for Egypt. But I think Egyptians need to um, definitely decide that for themselves. But again, yes, they need to decide that for themselves. But you mentioned the US. You, and we mentioned the international sphere, but then we remove it as if from this moment on, um, it's only all about Egyptians and it truly isn't. But I think what you're asking is, I don't like where we are now. How do we keep it going to find something better? And only Egyptians can, um, can decide that until, unless somebody else agitates for it. And I'd, I'd just like to point out that, you know, up until the very last day, uh, Gaddafi was saying, the revolution has to continue. You know, I mean, he's living in his green book revolution for the last 40 years, and, you know, he's denying the very revolution against his revolution. And also in Cuba, I mean, even Castro refers to the revolution, um, you know, 50 years later. I, I don't think that that's very constructive. I mean, a, a revolution is about a change and then moving on from that and working with that change. Hi, um, my name is Suzanne, and I'm... Egyptian, but we live here now, and I like, I went to Egypt right about the same time that you left, so it was really cool to be able to see everything that I missed. But um, I was wondering what you thought of the Western media's coverage of the uprising, if you felt like there was anything they missed or any bias in the coverage. Well, I think people were scrambling to try to make some sense of it and where to, how to spin it. News is not about what's happening, it's about what you want people to think is happening. Um, so I think American media really had, had no idea how to spin it. They weren't sure because, hey, that's their, that's their CIA asset that they've been propping up for 30 years that just went up in a cloud of dust. And really, how do you, how do you, you know, what do you latch on to? So, I mean, actually, I was quite lucky because I didn't have any satellite TV. I just had that little fuzzy TV set. <laughs> and all I could get on it was state TV which was very helpful for me because I would love to watch what the state TV was, was you know, what kind of lies they were trying to sell us, uh, which was, you know, oftentimes the exact opposite of what was happening. Um, so I, I think that eventually the channels got on it and Al Jazeera International was really very good at it. Um, but again, I was too busy filming, so I didn't really watch much of the news. Yes, hi. Um my name is Hamida, and um, my daughter is a professor at uh, AU. And um, tears came to my eyes as I saw the video because we were there two years, a year before and two years after, with my daughter doing research on and predicting the revolution to come and working with the, the youth on the ground uh, for the revolution. So I really, really, really applaud you, mostly not about the video, but about the commentary in the end that the struggle continues because that is the pulse on the ground that you brought. Please continue to bring the pulse of the people, because my, that's my daughter's passion, to bring the pulse of the youth that she worked with for so many years. She said, Mom, this guy thinks like me in terms of the struggle and the revolution continues and, and that the people did not get what they came to the streets for, and I think that they realized that. And often, the elders, like myself, many people think, well, they got a new president. <laughs> and, and I'm sitting, my daughter's saying, come to me, come meet me in the coffee shop in the middle of Zamalek or behind the scene. And she's saying, oh my God, does anybody really understand the youth are saying we've been hijacked? And so when the young man said, how do we keep it going? I don't think he means a revolution. I think he really means how do we continue to bring to the public that it's still going on, the struggle for the people. That's one thing. And then second is my, is to doctor, I forgot her name. I wanna know how we're gonna remember nada, because I feel, because I'm, I'm with a political scientist all the time, that the Iranian revolution and nada, the face of her, is not being remembered, uh, the struggle of the Iranians, because of so much about the Arab Spring being successful that the Iranian people are struggling, and I, I will never forget in my heart Nada, who was murdered there in Iran. So those things I hope we can address and continue to struggle. Thank, thank you. I guess just, um, I mean, part of what I spent a year working on last year was research about why, um, 
you know, you had the Iranian protests and then you had uh, cases of, of, of torture that really galvanized public attention and these killings such as uh, the, the shooting of Neda Agha Sultan um, and why that didn't spur, you know, uh, the kind of political change uh, that we saw in, in Egypt, for example, in the case of Khalid Saeed and how that spurred um, all sorts of mobilizations and, and it's very complicated why, <laughs> you know, we didn't see political change in Iran and we, we are seeing it here, but I'm, you know, eternally optimistic um, about Iran as well. The youth, I'm, I'm just as impressed with Iran's youth and, and their vision um, as, as I am with the Egyptian youth that I met, so. Zayek, um, I was... I went to uh, study abroad at AUC, and I got there January 14th, actually, of that year, and I'm uh, one of the few that stayed, and so this was just really, really compelling, and really, I had to look away a few times. I mean, I lived in Zamalek, so not quite there, so I don't want to rant, but anyway, it was just extremely compelling to see something like this. I saw an Al Jazeera English one, but this was a lot more on the ground, and so it was just really, really compelling, and so, but my question is kind of, how is it going back there now? I mean, because you made this film two years ago, you would have disappeared into the system and never been seen again. And so I'm just wondering, not that much has changed there really, governmentally, so I'm wondering, are you really safe? Like, how does that work? And uh, also, if you could please have a Stella for me and uh, Horea, I'd appreciate it. Uh, Horea? Yeah, you gotta, you gotta have one for me. I'll drink, drink one for you, no problem. <laughs> um, I don't know, you know, Egypt is, uh, in, in a way, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. You know, um, but there is there is kind of um, yeah, this is kind of a cloud of depression a little bit over the country. People are not quite sure they really wanted that revolution now, and you know, it, it, there's always this kind of self doubt. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think people have been trained so well to live under oppression and you know um, poverty, and you know that they're. In a sense, nothing's really changed for them, good or you know, for the for the worse or for the better. Uh, prices are going up, gas is getting more expensive. Uh, it's hard to get, you know, Buddha gas and things like this. But it seems like you know, the more pressures come on the people, the more they just adapt to them. And that's what they've been doing for you know, decades. So in a sense, I think Egyptians are quite well trained for this, and I think they'll come out on top. Um, I just want to say that these will be the last two questions, and um, I wanted to thank Dr. Othar, but um, in particular, Kareem, because you, you don't know, but he's been going all day. He's had one interview from one interview to another, so I really want to thank you in particular for putting up with us, and we're, our time's up, but I definitely want to take the last two questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Gaboul from Yemen. Uh, I'm doing a fellowship at NET. And um, I should say that I got emotionally touched with the, your documentary very much, especially saying some of the words that we also were saying in our revolution. And uh, I remember an Egyptian lady, she said, um, a young lady, she said, Tunisia inspired us and we inspired the whole world, and which is very true about the Egyptian revolution. But if you had half revolution, we had quarter revolution. So. Um, my question is, is, um, is about the other half of the revolution. Do you have any future plans to support what's going on now? And especially if you are half American and half Egyptian, maybe you could be a very good bridging between the two different communities. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're all rooting for Yemen. And we're all, you know, alhamdulillah, yani, inshallah, it's going to be okay in Yemen as well. Uh, they've been screwed for so long and there's so much more poverty in Yemen and uh, more corruption than Egypt, I think. Uh, although I've never been there, but um, I have a good friend who was Yemeni and she had to um, tie sheets together to escape her own house and jump out of a four-story window and run away with a broken foot. Um, because of the oppression that was, she was feeling under the hands of her own family. Uh, I think you know, that's probably a metaphor for the whole country, in a sense. Um, you know, 
we're all in it together, and it's not just the Middle East. It's, it, there's, a, there's a global revolution going on. People are tired of these uh, corrupt governments and uh, banksters, whatever you want. There's a big, long list, but it's happening all over the world, and I think that we have to understand that you know we're not alone. These are not isolated incidents. There is a massive amount of... Um, uh, dissatisfaction with the current status quo of the way governments are run, the way people are treated. And I think we all have to work together to, to make it better and not to look to governments or elected officials or institutions that are part of the problem, you know, even in this country, um, especially in this country, I would say. Hi, um, my name is Medina. Um, I just wanted to thank you for your film, first of all. It was very inspiring. Um, I'm personally from Afghanistan, and uh, all of this hope that I'm seeing in like the Arab Spring, you know, I want to translate that hope into my own country, but a lot of us Afghans have become hopeless. Um, you know, honestly, I feel like I, I, I am pretty hopeless to seeing any true change coming into our country. Um, and I see that mostly because, like, for instance, in Egypt, um, people were able to come together for one cause. Um, but there's so much fragmentation in countries such as Afghanistan. People don't relate together. Um, there's so many ethnic different groups and so on and so forth. And I just, like, this half-revolution idea, it frightens me because I hope that Egypt can still keep that one voice that you were mentioning before, and they don't end up becoming fragmented um, just like other nations in the long run because, you know, Afghanistan, no one's done, like, we can't ever have, you know, what's been happening in Egypt happen now because people are just fed up and they really have absolutely no hope and I hope that doesn't happen and I don't think it will but um, this inspires me to maybe give a little bit more hope within my own country. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've never been to Afghanistan. I've, I've been to Pakistan um, and I've been up to the Northwest Territories up in uh, Gilgit and uh, Hunza Valley and uh, Kunjarab Pass and these areas. And I've, I've witnessed, you know, Taliban-like uh, lifestyle. It's, it's very old lifestyle. They're very isolated communities in the mountains. Um, they have their own particular way of living. Um, I honestly think, you know, Afghanistan is, you know, it's, the, they say, the graveyard of, uh, of empires. I think um, America is getting bogged down there, and it's going to be very soon that they leave, you know. Once they do, I think, uh, you know, people are going to revert back to the way that they were living before. I think it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of investment, a lot of development to just to get kind of the people of that region um, who have been isolated for so long, just up to speed towards or closer to um, some kind of developmental standard that is a little closer to the 21st century, I think. You know, I mean, I, when I went there, it was really like going back in time. I felt like I was in, you know, 14th century. People have houses that have huge holes in the middle of, in, the, in their roof, and they have an open fire and smoke everywhere. And, you know, I, it's okay. That's the way people live there. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I think it also creates a certain mindset that, you know, is maybe out of, out of sync with, um, other, other levels of development in other parts of the world. So I think once uh, Afghanistan is, is devoid of foreign forces and gets a piece of some of the riches of its own country, uh, they found a massive lithium vein there that's worth trillions of dollars and of course they're going to have pipelines going through there. And um, This will bring money which hopefully will bring development which will hopefully bring stability. Uh, but again, it's going to take a lot of time, you know. Yeah. Can I add something and give you a little hope? Um, you know, simply because you care, They're, you're not the only one that cares, there's others too. So maybe, um, Af you know, Afghanis have a love for Afghanistan and it's the same way Egyptians did, but there's something about Egyptians that we haven't said here and the Egyptians in the audience can correct me if I'm wrong, but prior to this uprising prior to this revolution actually the Egyptian public was quite disenfranchised but also the idea is like nobody helps anybody you know everybody's got everybody's so disenfranchised that they couldn't possibly act as one I mean the, the names they call each other for fun 
is quite astounding. So don't think that Egyptians are super nationalists that su you know, like supersede everybody else. I think it was the moment, um, the conditions that came r together right. For instance, Kareem is a part of the old elite, and for, I, I'm sure he was disenfranchised for the longest time. And you could see him and his friends being galvanized in this moment. And so I think there's hope. Don't think that it's something wrong with the people. There's something wrong with the structure. All right, and um, I want to thank all of the audience for great questions, and uh, have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you.